I'm going to ask a question and then I'll sort of introduce people as we go along as they answer the question. And then we'll probably do another round. Um, we'll, see, we'll see where we get to. I've, I've threatened to time the answers to make sure that everyone gets to speak. Um, <laughs> um, the question that I thought was interesting was, um, is there something in the, because of this film covers so much, uh, and it's amazing how much John was able to fit into this. Uh, that obviously not everything gets the depth that it, you know, I mean, you could have a three hour film about each, you know, every five minutes in this film. So I'm inviting the people on the panel to speak a little bit more in depth about something that they feel like would be, um, would have been great to have a little more time on. Um, and I realize that even that is a, huge challenge. <laughs> but I'm going to start with um, Judith Schwartz, um, who is the author of um, three, well, probably more books than that, but three, three, three well-known to our community, um, Cows Save the Planet, Water in Plain Sight, and The Reindeer Chronicles. And um, my personal introduction is that, um, you know, I was writing the book The Ecology of Care and um, read Judy's first book, Cows Save the Planet, and literally changed my career over it. Like halfway through the book decided, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Um, called some friends, called one friend who's a climate activist, Vanessa Rule, and said, who do you know who's doing this work? And she introduced me to, uh, to, to Jane Hammer, who's here somewhere, to Adam, to Seth and Carl, who are also founders of Bio for Climate. And that, and th that was sort of my initial group of people that I started learning from and with, and Jim, and uh, anyway, so it started coming to some meetings here. Um, so anyway, so Judy's a very, very important person in my life. So what, what would you like to have a little more time about? Okay. And I am literally going to start a time. <laughs> okay, I'll talk really fast. Um, I trust you can hear me. Um, yes, a little closer. To okay, you. thank you, Judy. That's like anyway. A lot of us are kind of go, you know, on, you know, taking a walk on memory lane here. Yeah. So again, this film covers so much. So the way I think of it is, <coughs> if I were going to be a consultant on part four, what I would want to do, you know, like what gets me very excited about in terms of climate solutions is more about animals so not only animals in a farm context but animals just you know throughout our ecosystems because i feel you know as, as john pointed out with the methane situation that there's so much misunderstanding about how animals impact the land and they play you know all wildlife play such a, a crucial role in the cycling of moisture carbon nutrients and energy and I'm even coming to understand knowledge so um, you know for example in the water cycle John mentioned beavers but animals do play a large role in managing managing vegetation and managing the water cycle enhancing fire resilience by um, you know browsing what might become fire fodder so that's what I that's what I would like to do if, if, if I were going if there were going to be a part four and I was asked to make suggestions. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thanks, Robert. You blew through that. You could say more. You get too much <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have more time for more other discussions as well. So um, um, Dan, um, Dan is Dan is the man that I run into everywhere. It's very funny. I have a joke about that. Like every conference I go to, Dan is there. <laughs> we run into each other in the Paris airport. And <laughs> um, um, Dan is doing really Dan Kittred is doing really really important work around nutrient density of food. It's been really instrumental in developing technology, a handheld instrument that can measure the nutrient density in uh, a carrot or a steak or, or whatever you like to eat. Um, <clears throat> um, he is the founding director of the Bionutrient Food Association. Um, 
Uh, his parents were founders of NOFA, I believe. Is that right? I yes. Evolved for three, five years. Yes. Um, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, and um, there's a lot more, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep these kind of short. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Happy to be here. Uh, I remember being memory, memory lane uh, speaking here at Tufts many years ago, um, uh, and I just want to. Uh, I'll talk about what I think I would emphasize more, but I just want to affirm um, that I have yet to see anything anywhere near as coherent and cogent on the critical role of the water cycle in climate. Full stop. Period. In the conversation, I think this is an extremely important work. I. Salute John for this, and I think it's a really um, it's, this is extremely important insight and understanding that are not part of the common conversation. Um, a lot of the sort of the, the red herrings and the science, the quote unquote science about climate, I think is is well um, I don't know <laughs> processed here and shown to be what the, what the real important factors are. So, um, yeah, at our organization, we've you know worked with, with John and Hummingbird Bird Films to uh, support a number of, of local groups putting up their uh, showings, and I invite everyone else here, you know, if you think the climate's an important conversation to help get this word out, because the water cycle um, and its power to reverse warming is, is I mean, the duty, of course, is critically involved in this conversation, and, you guys have all been part of this conversation, so it's it's really wonderful. But I think just this movie is a the film, technically is a film, right? It's not a movie. Um, <clears throat> just want to affirm that. Uh, as far as what I would focus more on, uh, my, my personal passion is, of course, the quality of food. Um, and we've been working at the BFA for a number of years now um, to understand the variation of nutrient levels in food, um, and then to see if those nutrient levels connect with soil health, etc. Um, for those who don't know, uh, you know, 2x, 5x, 10x, 20x variations, like this cal carrot has as much calcium in it as those four carrots, or this leaf of spinach has as much iron in it as those 10 leaves of spinach, uh, et cetera. That is the variation of nutrient levels in food right now. Um, so just because it says, you know, whatever, I want a bite of a D in your carrot on the bag does not mean that actual is the amount in the carrot. There's a massive variation of nutrient levels in food and those nutrient variations connect directly to soil health, right? We've looked at variety, we've looked at soil type, we've looked at organic versus local versus permaculture versus tillage versus no-till versus cover crops. We look at all these other types of identifying factors and they don't connect. Organic does not connect to more nutritious. Local does not connect to more nutritious. No-till does not connect to more nutritious. Certain soil types do not connect to more nutritious. What connects to more nutritious is more soil life. The level of respiration of microbes in the soil <clears throat> is the thing that correlates with nutrient levels in food. And so, from my perspective, having all these insights about how you know we can work with nature to create a, a healthy environment is great. Um, for me, the question is, how do you drive that? How do you bring it to scale in the dominant paradigm of the culture we've got right now. And so our thought is, if we can help people choose the food that's more nutritious, like there's three bags of carrots on the shelf, one's 20 out of 100, one's 40 out of 100, one's 80 out of 100. If you could take your smartphone, flash a camera at the carrot, not a, not a, a, you know, a, a QR code, but actually the carrot and read the nutrient levels in each of those bags, I'm guessing people would take the 80s and leave the 20s. And you might tell your friends, that this variety, whether it's Pony Love or Bolt House Farms, is better, and they might take those also. And our thought is, if all the 80s leave the shelf and the 20s stay there, maybe the supermarket um, the produce manager is going to order more of the 80s and not order any more 20s. And so the idea is to align economic self-interest with ecological self-interest, with health self-interest, right? We see, understand nutritional deficiencies are foundational in chronic disease chronic disease is at epidemic levels across the board. Um, so we can really align the environment and our own health. Um, so that would be what I would focus more on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom, <laughs> I haven't seen you since your living room where we were having a conversation with Walter Yan. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Tom Garo is I, I want to get that. I want to get all these 
names right, biogeochemist bio and marine biologist and the president of the Global Coral Reef Alliance um, and Remineralize the Earth and also the author of kind of an amazing book called Geotherapy. Yeah, thank you, Judy. You know, it's a pleasure to see this movie. I know, am I speaking loud enough? Can I come here? Hold it close to your mouth. Hold it close to your mouth. Sorry about that. I want to congratulate John on this incredible movie. It's what I love about it. It's all information. It's full of educational material for just about anybody. And I wish it could be shown in every high school in this country and around the world. It's really important. All right? Um, so, it's really, I like films that are full of information. I'm not, I'm not here to be entertained. I don't want to be informed that this is one of the really great movies. The other thing I want to congratulate on, him on is the incredible photography. And uh, yeah, I now know it's not all his own, but still all the yeah. <laughs> and, uh, All the good Congratulations. Stuff <laughs> so I want to say something about what we do. Um, every ecosystem can be regenerated if you wish to. And it's a matter of essentially increasing the recycling of the carbon and the water and the nutrients and the biodiversity as much as possible. And of course, industrial agriculture does the opposite. <laughs> and the sad thing is, when we talk about regeneration, is that there are lots of people using our words for opposite ends. So for instance, big ag is very much into the notion of regenerating landscape. They mean they could at first cut everything down, herbicide it, plant a single clone of herbicide-resistant, fast-growing trees, and they cut them all down and burn them to make energy and pump the CO2 into a hole in the ground, like an oil well, so they can get more oil. And that's, that's quote, carbon capture and sequestration is what Big Ag is moving towards and they're presenting it as a regenerative solution even though it destroys biomass and destroys biodiversity and destroys the soils. So <coughs> we do have people using our words. Sorry, I need to be louder. Excuse me. Yes, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I do want to say something about what's happened this year. As we all know, this year is the hottest year in history. It's so far harder than anything else that the modelers are all shocked. It's warming up much faster than the models indicate that should can happen according to their models. But it's no surprise to those of us who work in the natural world. So I just want to say, you know, how what is happening this year is triggering tipping points and negative feedbacks on climate change and making the situation far worse. And that's why it is making it so much more urgent. The reason it's gotten hot and hotter so much more quickly is because of ocean circulation changes. Instead of that, 93% of the heat goes down to the deep sea, into the ocean, so we don't feel it. Okay? It takes 1,500 years and then it will all come back to us. At the moment, we're not feeling the heat. If the mixing of that heat down to the deep sea slows down just a tiny fraction, the whole surface of the earth gets warmer quickly. And that's what's happened this year. And there's a big jump in temperature, and it must be due to changes in ocean circulation. Now, what's that caused, among other things, in the Caribbean, we've never had the water so hot for so long over such a large area. I'm just back from Jamaica yesterday. It's my home island. I've dived in Jamaica for 17 years. I've been warning for 35 years what would happen if we didn't control global warming. Our reefs would overeat and die. And that's what's happening right now. All our corals are completely bleached from heat stroke, and they're dying. They're dying. And that's happening over the entire Caribbean region. We've never had it so hot, so long over such a large area. I've been following this from the very first event and warning people. But that's what's happening now, facing mass mortality, a mass collapse of the most critical marine ecosystems on which all small islands depend for food, for economy, for protection, everything else, biodiversity. So we're really at a crisis with temperature. Another example of that was to the Amazon. The Amazon is having the worst dry season in its history right now. I spent a lot of time working in Amazonia in the past, and um, the rivers have never been drier. That means the plants are no longer pulling down CO2, but decomposition is putting it back into the air. 
So it's going to have a huge impact on the global carbon cycle. We won't know until the drought is over. The drought has moved from one end of Amazonia to another all summer long. It's been a catastrophe. Now, other places are trying to. Panama, the Panama Canal's drying up. That's your five minutes. Hmm? That's your five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's much more to say. Because it's, it's really a crisis. We have to start solving the problem now. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. And thank you so much for uh, everybody here for your work. Anastasia Makarieva. <laughs> um, is an atmospheric physicist um, at the Petersburg Nuclear Physics Institute and co-formulator of the biotic pump theory. And I have always thought of you as my sister over there because I know, um, um, actually Judy and I used to be in like a women working in soil health group and you are an honorary member of that. But I've always thought of you as another person who is keeping these ideas in mind and also fighting, fighting, I'm imagining, to, to be heard because it's not so easy. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, for us, for me and my cause and uh, to be here. And uh, you speak into the mic. Hold on, right next to you, yeah. Is it okay? Oh, okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. So, um, I, I already like congratulated John on this film, so I will concentrate on what I would like to see like more. So it is about regenerating life, but it is important to understand uh, and to decide what are we going to regenerate and for which purposes. Because the climate system is very, very complex, sophisticated. So for example, if we take clouds, Clouds both cool and warm, and it strongly depends the net effect of whether the right type of clouds is produced at the right time. So when we uh, restore a farmland, even if it is organic farmland, and it produces food for us, we cannot say that this farmland will, will be producing the right type of clouds because this is not the nature, how the natural ecosystem has evolved. If on this farmland there was a natural forest, so it is the forest, natural forest ecosystem that will produce the right type of cloud. I'm simplifying just for you to get the idea. So basically, we do need uh, like good food, but we, we need, if we think about planetary health, we need to find a balance to set aside just natural ecosystems uh, to, to do this climate regulating job work or to perform this climate regulating function for us. Because what we maximize for food production won't be maximizing climate function. This doesn't go hand in hand because these are different systems. And this is very important because we are now hearing more and more that all ecosystems are degrading, like Tom said, and I'm like, my heart. It hurts to hear about the Amazon, but there is a danger in this message that everything is lost, so everything is like unhealthy, but it is not so. There are, uh, even the Amazon forest is not like lost, so it's been disturbed but it is, it is still alive. So there are many natural ecosystems that need to be preserved like today. And if we just stop destroying them now, it will uh, mitigate the climate destabilization. So, and then we regenerate, of course. But w when we regenerate, so as a theoretical physicist, I'm used to see the problem comprehensively, like when all laws of nature, like matter conservation are satisfied. So imagine we are 100 years and 50 years ago. There were no pesticides, no industrial, like big farm. Are we going there? Are we going to return to, to that condition? Or we have learned something more compared to, because food was organic at the time, right? Uh, and it was okay, but 
we were then on the trajectory which brought us here, where we are now. So what have we learned? Where do we go? So, and I think a very important message that we learned with all our science and satellite data and all that, that these natural ecosystems that many of us have, have not ever seen in our, like, uh, I'm also a city child. I, so I, it could have happened that I wouldn't uh, seen, have seen them. So they play a very essential role in climate stabilization by regulating the water cycle and the climate, the cloud cover. So we need to preserve them in the first place before we return. Yeah, another minute, keep going. Yeah, Do you want to yeah, finish? Yeah, and uh, uh, as I have a few more seconds, what I would also like uh, to see more. So I would say we need a dialogue with the mainstream climate science. Even if it is, I know that it would be uh, uh, like uh, difficult. So if you approach, uh, if John approached, and uh, probably he did, a major climate scientist, he wouldn't, he would probably not agree to be part of this field. But still, this is very important because many of them are uh, well-meaning people, and they have their arguments. And until we are, like divide, here we are, and here they are. So we won't solve it because scientific language is the language that unites the language of, rash, of rational thinking, which is not reductionism. It is just, you know, we all need to be helped and all that. So somehow we need to involve them, I think. Thank you so much. <laughs>
a, a small farmers group that had been meeting through the whole thing uh, <clears throat> had proposed a plan that, that basically scrapped the whole payment for ecosystem services thing and, and said, let's just take this money and give it to farmers who are already doing conservation. And that was what we decided to do. But it was, uh, it was very skin of our teeth that that worked out that way. Um, again, very last minute, there was a report to the legislature that had been written that explained that we decided not to do a payment for ecosystem services, but the rest of the report read as an advertisement for the financialization of nature. And so, uh, so basically I stayed up for 24 hours <laughs> rewriting the report at the very last minute before it squeaked in um, so that it was actually set, explaining why this was not okay. Uh, but I just want to say that this is, you know, when John talks in the film about um, <clears throat> about the, the capitalism and the, and the, you know, corporatization, et cetera, um, we've gone even beyond the, you know, the GMOs and the, and et cetera. This is, it's unbelievable amount of financial control that is hard to see. So, um, Anyway, I, I, I'm a little worried that our panel here is becoming sort of doom, doom stage, but, uh, but uh, um, and I, I think that the answer, though, lies in the thing that started that thing in the first place, which is that the people who know how to restore watersheds uh, and restore the small water cycle and who understand these things, this whole thing that this film is about, uh, need to be organizing themselves into working groups, into groups that can help the public understand how, you know, the soil sponge is like bread instead of like flour, um, uh, and that we can we can reduce flooding and drought and wildfire and restore the water cycle and have clean water and have abundant food and have nutrient dense food uh, through working working with soil and plants and, and biology and forests. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to do one more quick round, um, and then we'll, we'll still have plenty of time for, for you. I actually have a question for all of you. Um, the quick round is, is um, what's your long thought process and like what is the thing that you've been trying to understand over the years and what is it that you're interested in looking into next you know we see this like what's Judy's next book on what's John's you know what are you thinking about now that you have finished this film um, because I think I think probably everyone in this room has a long history with thinking about this kind of systems view and um, on one level or another and it's pretty amazing to get to change one's career or to write the next book or to develop the next project and so so i'm just it's an invitation to talk about where you see this going next or what you think is important for people you know how would you organize start to organize people anastasia do you want to start that uh, I can just uh, say what we are doing at the moment. So uh, oh, we are working on investigating the role of uh, natural ecosystems in atmospheric moisture transfer. So we saw beautiful pictures of rivers like which take water away from land. So there is a reverse process bringing water back. And we study how forests influence this process actually intensifying it. But um, <clears throat> this is um, something that uh, when you have a theory, like you have major quantitative uh, answers, scales of the problem, but then we have this very complicated global climate models that do not show this response. So the, the problem for us is to um, kind of produce evidence that would persuade the mainstream climate community that this effect is real, 
And to do so, uh, we turn to a much more simple problem of tropical cyclones. So as atmospheric physicists, we are studying tropical cyclones, which actually function on the same principle that the forests draw moisture inland on, on the dynamics of con uh, condensing atmosphere, when the water vapor condenses in the atmosphere. So actually, uh, but to be taken seriously, you have to show that the prevailing view on tropical cyclones is not entirely correct, to say the least. And it is not very, uh, not, not very easy for outsiders, because we do not belong to the tropical cyclone community, but <laughs> So, so this is like a very sophisticated strategy. When you look at it from outside, it has maybe little to do to the protection of forests, which is our ultimate goal. But we are moving very steadily and can happily report some success. So this year we published a very detailed critique of the current theory, so like clearing the ground. And we are now working on the next paper just to you know, to show how it works in reality. So we're like, I think we have like found an Achilles heel of the of the established views, and we can like hit it and make a hole and then <laughs> penetrate, and then this new understanding will flourish. So it is like a conspiracy plot. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Nothing is leaving this room except how it's except the link to the movie. <laughs> Tom? What are you working on? Uh, yes, yeah. well, politics and skill don't understand the magnitude of the problem because they haven't felt the heat yet. And we haven't yet either. It's barely beginning. <coughs> That's the important point. This year, the pollution from forest fires to the atmosphere was a Often in Canada, about as oh, much as China's industrial production. Oh, sorry. Okay. The, the forest fire pollution from Canada to the atmosphere was about as big as China much of this year. Right now, Borneo is burning, Australia is burning, so there's forest fires in, in Africa and in Bolivia right now. So, in fact, they just had a massive increase in air pollution this year. Um, the other thing is that the ice caps. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, you see, this is better, huh? Right? Oh, well, sort of bad. <clears throat> okay, uh, the ice caps have never been smaller, and that's causing another albedo feedback that's accelerating warming. And in effect, if we don't increase the size of the ice caps very quickly, we're going to have runaway overshoot. We'll pass the tipping point for coral reefs, and we're going to pass many more. So there isn't really more time. We're going to start regenerating, but it may be too late for that. It's certainly too late for coral reefs, I'm afraid to say. And uh, there'll be more and more ecosystems that will collapse, but we need action right away <coughs> from governments, and we're not seeing it. What we're going to face in, in COP is, is the oil industry in control. Tom, is there, some, is there one or two actions that you think people here uh, are, are most key because I think it's so easy to get overwhelmed. Is there is there something that you think is well? well that's difficult. We need bottled up action on a community level everywhere because we're not getting top down action. I mean, the fact is that all the governments are there trying to protect business as usual, where they make their money from their pocket money from the oil industry and the coal industry. So they're not doing anything to help. They're they're just playing with words and they're refusing to act. Um, I, I first I want to push back against what you're saying because I think it's basically entirely antithetical to what the point of the movie was, which it, is it's not the level of carbon in the atmosphere, it's the water cycle and how that water cycle functions that affects the heating. And as I understand from the last 500 million years, uh, if you look into geological time scales, um, the average level of carbon in the atmosphere has been, you know, thousands of ppm, and the temperatures, you know, have been colder at other points in time, carbon is not is not the gas that connects primarily to temperature and atmosphere. I think that's a central point of this movie. So I just want to push back against that point you're making. And I would just agree also with Didi, I talked to someone in Vermont recently who was telling me about how this work was being done effectively to colonize nature, like properly <laughs> you know, own and 
and control and, and charge rights for it, all this kind of stuff. I feel like it's a massive land grab. So I, I question the whole carbon um, as a problem conversation. I think that's the essential point of this movie. I think it is a red herring upon which many, well, many people have been, you know, we, we the, 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 you know, what's it, the dog uh, sees the red herring, smells it, and goes off, goes off the, uh, the true path, the true track. So I just want to uh, push back against that whole carbon is the problem conversation. To the point of solutions, <clears throat> my work is foundationally connecting soil health and human health through food and nutrition. And there's a, it, you know, we've been working on this for, for since 2017. We've run thousands of samples of crops from dozens of different types of crops, from hundreds of farms, from multiple continents. Um, we've been looking at, at hundreds of different microbes and, and biochemical compounds and overlaying management practices with soil metrics, with human health metrics, human, you know, feed the person this and see what happens to them. Um, and it really looks like you only get food that has nutrition at high levels, which correlates with flavor and aroma, because we are evolved as animals to determine what's good for us. And a carrot that tastes like a carrot is good for you, and a carrot does not, does not. A tomato that tastes like a tomato is good for you, a tomato does not, does not. Right? A peach that tastes like a peach is good for you. Right? All these things, there's various nutrient levels that connect directly with soil health, that connect with the water cycle, connect with climate positive effects. And so, as far as we're concerned organizationally, Let's focus on feeding ourselves as well as possible, and our neighbors. If we simply focus on food that is more nutritious, that by definition pulls through from an economic standpoint the management practices that will reverse this dynamic. So I would say focus on solutions, focus on nutrition, focus on food, and see if we can get all the market credit stuff out of here. Right? As a farmer myself, I make more money when my plants are healthier than I'm ever gonna get for carbon credits for you know, a couple acres of vegetables, right? I mean, it's just the net market profit incentive for getting a premium for quality is way more than any of these schemes is ever gonna give you for the carbon credits or the ecosystem service credits or whatever. So um, I say let's focus on the food itself and get everything else out of the, out of the equation um, because that seems to be a wonderful biomarker connection. Um, thank you. So in terms of what I'm focusing on, well, one thing is that I'm really enjoying the opportunity to sit back and, in, and see other people take so effectively and beautifully the conversation further, like John with this film, like yesterday evening with Anastasia, we hosted a um, young man named Zach Weiss who started this platform called Water Stories, which is doing wonderful education about why the water cycle matters, how to heal the water cycle, and many people are, you know, meeting each other like your classes and collaborating. So just that's really, and then um, young people with Bio for Climate who are writing beautiful pieces, beautiful books. So, so that's one thing that's you know, just has been wonderful. And um, so I'm focusing more on the human side of all of this. And one aspect relates to what Anastasia was saying, to talk to climate scientists. So I've been having a experience <coughs> engaging with people who are very much of the carbon is everything story. And what I'm learning and I kind of knew this, that it's not about facts that's going to convince people, but listening to them and helping them feel comfortable enough to accept that maybe what they've devoted decades to isn't 100% right. So that's an interesting process. So. Dealing with people, understanding their fears of change, fear of being wrong, um, you know, just all the things that, that we hold and kind of keep us in our little boxes. And kind of working in my relationships, my working relationships, 
And as a um, kind of coach, I'm doing climate coaching with young people because I think it's so important to help young people feel a sense of agency and hope and see where they can fit in because one way to move through this very difficult time with greater ease is to feel that you can be part of the solution. And I want to help people, especially young people, be able to find that pathway. Thanks. I'd like to add a fact to this oh, discussion. So, uh, so there's going to be, I get to talk next, and then we're going to do a little turn and talk, and then we're going to hear questions from the audience okay, that so were, so that, so like, framing questions for us all to go home and think about. Great. And then, we'll, and then I promise we will be done by five, so. Um, um, so um, I just want to really strongly recommend reading an article called uh, Miyan Miyan and the Mystery of the Med Missing Mediterranean Storms, which um, Judy wrote about long, long ago. Uh, and um, it's about the, the idea that there is a whole other study of climate change that got defunded. Um, and it is the history of that. And, th and that's, that aspect of climate was the aspect of land systems and land use change. Uh, and that article does a phenomenal job of, of tracing some of that history through time, which I think is an untold story and is a really key piece of, of what's important here. Repeat the title. It's called Milan Milan, or it looks like Milan Milan, M-I-L-L-A-N, M-I-L-L-A-N. And if you put that in and Rob Lewis, it'll come up. It's on the Bio for Climate website. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. His substack is called The Climate According to Life. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is um, I have um, both classes quarterly through the Land and Leadership Initiative um, that are on this topic um, that bring together people from dozens and dozens of countries each time. Uh, and then some of those people continue on to the land and leadership development community, which is a small group of us that meets weekly to really think about how we think about things. Because it really is about how we think, not that informs what we think. Um, and um, what, one of the things that we're planning, starting to plot and plan for this coming year is community engagement uh, of people getting out and doing like that laser laser thermometer thing, um, getting it going through Instagram or whatever, um, but but around the idea of of developing beautiful microclimates, you know, beautiful biodiverse microclimates that are oases uh, that then, when connected, will connect, reconnect. You know, if we get enough of those can help reconnect the water cycles, reconnect the biotic pump, reconnect people with the land. Um, and I think we need, I think we need language, I think we need stories. Thank you, John, for, <laughs> for, for getting that started in a really big way here. Because um, I think this is a great um, both educational piece and uh, conversation starter. So uh, there's, you've done just an enormous favor to this community of people that's been thinking about this. Um, so the last thing we're going to do is, um, do you remember at the very beginning of the film, Lynn, Mar Lynn Margulis said, I'm not going to quote it exact, but that what we need is the ability, learn the ability to ask better and better questions. So. So I'd like you to take like a minute to turn and talk to a neighbor to so formulate your question. And then we're gonna do like a, a Quaker meeting of questions. We're gonna say our questions into the room without, the, the, we are not the experts. We're all the experts, okay? The problem with the panel is it seems like, it's like, oh, you're gonna ask us a question and we're gonna answer it for you. but. We're gonna, we're gonna, this, we may, we may not get every single one, but we're gonna try to get all the questions. If there, there were some index cards around. Is that what you're holding up, or is that a finger? Yes. Oh. Because we talk so much about educating, 
but we are here, you know, the older generation. I think it's time that we create a discipline in high school. So we give the young people the best knowledge and the basis to create new solutions that we are not even able to see them because we see them from a different perspective as adults. But you know, as a young person, you are curious, you want to discover new things. So you are part of policy creating. Why, how do we bring that to schools, to government, to bring everybody to become alert? I have to tell you, I have a degree in environmental sciences. 50 years ago, when I looked for a job, they told me I'm 10 years ahead of time. So I worked in the nuclear field. I gave up all that because it didn't exist. So how do we justify that? So here is the disconnect. This film should be shown in every school across the country. And it will. And it will. We're, we are going to make that happen. We need <laughs> the knowledge, but from the ground up, I not agree. from the up down. Yeah, great. That, that's where is the disconnect. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that was an example of a question. If we can make the question even a little more condensed, so it's just how do we get this film, et cetera? Okay. But I'm gonna have because everybody's bursting. I'm gonna have you turn and talk to a neighbor first, so that you can like get your question out. And I'm gonna give you 30 seconds each to formulate your question. I will tell you when when to stop talking and let your neighbor talk. Okay. <laughs> All right. We have five minutes before we're gonna do our closing. So this is I'm gonna demonstrate. I'm going to demonstrate what I mean by asking a question. Asking a question is like, how do we get young people involved? That's a question. Okay? Another question might be, I'm wondering, what, how did water get lost? Or is it true that carbon isn't important? So, so it's like one thought, not a lot of explanation. Okay, and I'll, I'm going to go around and, uh, and just offer the mic, all right? Who's got a question? Have you got one? Okay. How do I begin my relationship with a little piece of soil in my area? Perfect. <laughs> um, I think that our greenhouse gas emissions are important. Um, Dan says he thinks the, uh, the food system is uh, probably the most important. Uh, how do you decide between these? How do you how do you quantify their relative importance? Great. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if anyone can speak to the increase in the incidence of celiac disease and farming practices. If the uh, Tom is pointing out that the ocean seems to be the driver of actual net change, has anyone or do we? How do we approach the whole ocean? Economics is a major problem in all of the efforts that are underway in this group. How do we fix economics? Um, what can we all do together that we can't each do individually? Great question. How do you write an academic article in a story that somebody will want to read? Yes. <laughs> How can we share insight on the role of regeneratively raised farm animal products, or just animal products, in our diet? <coughs> How do we scale the planting of Myawaki style microforests all the way across the country in every community? I came from New Jersey. There are 565 municipalities, and it can happen very quickly with some organization. So I hope to find it here. Thank you. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> we get that. Uh, it's two parts. How can we change the global conversation? Where can we most effectively invest resources for restoration, especially with respect to cooling? Thank you, 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 you. Okay. <laughs> uh, people like um, simple answers to questions in terms of generating hope, whether it's CO2, it's water, it's the animals, it's um, ecocide law, um, how we frame the complexity of the issues we're doing and retain hope. Uh, 
I'm bringing the question of my 20-something son, having watched the film, saying, well, how, how does it work when the profit monsters are going like this, and the regenerators are going like this, and this is a graph of impact time. <laughs> and he's convinced that legislation might be the answer, but that's my question. <laughs> so, um, just to support Tom Burrow, the last eight months had a one in 100,000 year heat event. It's off the scales compared to the one in 100 or 500 year flooding events that we've had. Each of you has a piece of the puzzle. Anastasia, your work on native pollinators and evapotranspiration is powerful. Tom, you're dealing with the ocean currents. How do you make Manage food and Judith, have fun with this question. <laughs> to get money and co how do we get money and corporations out of politics? <laughs> <laughs> how does a church or any religious institution or even a homeowner make their best decision about investing in renewable energy or buying a vacant lot? Oh, thanks. Um, how can we get a TikTok challenge for the youth to do on this and really get a lot of youth making little films on their own about this? Put it out. How do we make it illegal to cut down a tree without, without some kind of permission from a larger ecological perspective? How do we engage people to take better care of their neighborhoods? Yeah. How do we change the market paradigm? I'm not sure the listening is... I know it's part of the equation, but it's not everything. How do we get faster at changing the market paradigm in people's head to something that's more akin to uh, what happens, the complexities in nature? Yeah, yeah, we'll get, we'll get back over there, don't worry. I'm wondering if anybody has a story about having spoken with um, an executive in an oil company or something analogous to that who's really invested in a different paradigm and what it was like if you were able to sort of get them to question that. How did that happen? Uh, this is a systems change question. Um, I. I I read a lot about science, I read a lot about ecology, and I also read a lot about finance. And one of the things in finance is that these folks are stuck in a systems, reinforcing systems loop, that even when they know the problems, they can't often get out of it, they'll lose their job. CEO, CEOs will lose their job if they try to address the problems they have. So how do we, together, help the profit monster find an off-ramp from the reinforcing systems loop that they're facing, because that is the root cause of this. It started with three little words at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, maximize your returns. We're very smart, so we're going to achieve our design statement. And the design statement, you know, we've, we've accomplished it beyond the planet and the people to provide it. So how do we redesign, how do we redesign the design statement? How do you find local farmers who are actually building soil? Actually, I, I don't have a question, but uh, I have a comment to, to the film. So we have to keep it very short, because we literally have to be out of here yeah. for minutes. So. so I would point out that, um, in theory, there is a, a concept which calls um, biotic regulation concept, which gives us a whole picture on the problems which we mentioned, uh, namely floods, uh, droughts, floods, hurricanes, uh, all the disasters, all the extreme events. And it's related to the uh, loss of biotic control. So the most powerful as a unique system which can control the environment and keep the climate in stable, suitable for people, state, are natural ecosystems. Of course, one can uh, talk about the um, problem, 
how to find the balance between uh, human society, uh, food production, industry, and uh, ecology. But I am pretty sure the answer can be found only on scientific level. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's an extremely complicated problem and needs to be investigated more. And <clears throat> first of all, what we can do is to protect uh, natural forest ecosystems. Study them and, yeah, thank you. James. Okay, good question that I had. Um, how nutritious is hydroponic food compared to the soil grown food? Yeah, that's what I thought. How can we shut down the DCR Department of Forestry uh, and stop them from being the butchers of uh, forests um, and the protectors of forests? Thank you for having five different, or ten different perspectives on this panel. Now I'm torn. Should I adopt the new cause of enlisting, harnessing the economic forces of the marketplace at the point of sale, or should I continue my career dedication to protecting the most productive ecosystems in the world, wetlands, especially salt marshes, the ocean, and the near shore? Thank you. Um, I'm going to just highlight what Tom has said. He, he's raising quite often the urgency. It's now. This is. We're in the crisis, we all know that. We're, we're in deep question. problem right question. now. Question. And so the question is, how do we make regeneration, ecological restoration, our way of life at all levels? I have two factors. In a world where the CO2 level is above 400, how do we keep ice on the planet? And how do we have shelves for shellfish like corals and oysters? <laughs> Thanks, Eight billion people get up every day and are part of this global economy, which is extremely extractive. What is the first step that we can take to build a more regenerative economy? And Didi and others, it seems to me the thing you built up about a small group of people thinking out a problem, but also working on a report to the legislature about the watershed systems, that's one thing that I feel needs to happen everywhere. And the same with the interworkings of financial interests on all of our resources. That's it. I want to reiterate one of the last points in the film, which is do no harm. And our human brains are programmed to do, do, do. We have a lot of neurons. They want to do stuff. And it's really hard to figure out where we shouldn't be doing things. But the first thing we need to do is have an unbiased, multidisciplinary, compassionate conversation about what are our ecological lifelines that we shouldn't be messing with. Then we can figure out the rest of the areas that we can put energy and farming and housing and all the things we need. But without that plan, we are chipping away. How do we make that plan? Sorry, that's my question. <laughs> oh, and I have the handouts, sorry, uh, if you want those. But there's a historical example that we should examine. In 1942, victory gardens began in the United States. By 1944, harvest, it produced a third to a half of all fruits and vegetables grown in the United States. How do we do that now? We've done it before. We can do it again. Well done. How do we mobilize some of the feeling in this room to work together to accomplish something that will actually speak to power? Uh, Tom keeps mentioning again and again, we've got to change how the legislature acts. They're not going to change until their feet are in the flames. And we've done it before. We've got to do it again. Who wants to do that? Sign up somewhere here. Just a quick thing, uh, to, speaking of signing up, if you want to go back to our table, we have bills in the legislature right now to save about 9% of Massachusetts forests, permanently protect them. So that, that's the kind of urgent stuff I think we need to do. Anyway, thanks. And the farm bill.